Dr. Dasgupta, please come over and uh, guide us to the next part of the program. Thank you so much. Big responsibility, Jerry. <laughs> Good evening again. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, this has been a labor of love for a lot of people. Uh, uh, and I thank Devlina and her crew for having um, organized this for the ninth uh, year. Today is really a great day. Uh, may even be a historic day since it truly has the potential to profoundly change our way of thinking about life. I am Surajit Dasgupta and the World Society has bestowed on me this unique honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Mani Bhomik. It is truly an honor. It is an honor not simply because uh, on a personal basis, uh, it is also an honor because I am an IIT graduate uh, and you were one of the first recipients of your uh, PhD from that university. It is also an honor as an ex-member uh, of Tagore Society because I don't think that this could be a more appropriate way to exemplify what Tagore Society stands for. Tagore Society, as you've already heard, is truly a unique organization. Uh, it is not a cultural organization, not a charity organization, nor religious, nor political. Its only mission is to propagate Tagore's philosophy of a bodiless mind. That's it. However, perhaps better than anybody else, Tagore represents the cream of our ancient truths from the Vedas. In fact, the ultimate distillation of all those truths. That there is an eminent, borderless, all-pervading, unifying spirit or consciousness that binds us all. Tagore's songs, poems, writings, so vividly and effortlessly pervades these truths. It is why probably why they continue to live in our hearts and minds. It is in this context that the presence of Dr. Bohomik in our midst today is so important and relevant and almost a seminal event for our society. Dr. Bohomik rose from the most abject of poverty in lower Bengal, rural Bengal, to the pinnacle of scientific and personal achievements in the US. His invention of the exomer laser technology is at the root of so many benefits that we enjoy today without even realizing it. Just as I talk, two of my immediate family members have just underwent laser retina surgery in the last one week, all thanks to the wonders of that technology. Dr. Bomit's achievements have garnered him many accolades and honors, and I don't think it will be uh, I can do justice reciting all those things, uh, and as well as a spot in the TV show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. The Indian government conferred on him the Padma Shri Award in 2011. Really, his life could be the stuff of an inspiring movie if somebody took on that as a project. But it is not his scientific and professional achievements that we want to talk or hear about today but his own search for the all-pervading, unifying spirit, the Brahman of the Vedas, as he calls it, the common source or the primary field, as is written in his book. In fact, a search for the grand unification, in fact, I can say it's a search for the grand unification of science and spirituality, which was also at the core of Tagore's world vision, which Tagore society is seeking to propagate. Dr. Bromick has brilliantly elucidated this coming convergence in his book, Codename God, which is outside for your pleasure. Tagore talked about the concept of a Vishwa Mahamanap, a truly great human. Today we have amongst us 
one such great human. So without much ado, Dr. Mani Bhavi. We have a short video on Dr. Bhomik. Before he starts his talk, we'd like to show you that. Very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Such a great pleasure to be here amongst this exquisite audience, all lover of my spiritual guru, Rabindranath Tagore, <clears throat> as I consider Einstein as my scientific guru, Tagore was my spiritual guru, <clears throat> and uh, I couldn't be more delighted than to have the opportunity of talking about the Indian wisdom as eloquently explained by Tagore, and now, which is shown to be anchored in modern science that actually grew out of the intuitive exposition, expertise of uh, my scientific guru Einstein. So um, I must say that uh, what could be get pleasure than to see a dedicated group of people here who is keeping his legacy alive. It's fair to say that Tegel's legacy is well and alive in Bengal and in India in general, as I epitomized by the fact that the national anthem of both countries are based on his poems. But unfortunately, his legacy is become diminished in other countries. And that's why I really admire and thank you so much for keeping his wonderful legacy alive, which we really need today in this fractious world as much as it, as it's always. So I'd like to um, talk to you about the basic message that they were distilled from the age-old wisdom of uh, India in his eloquent poems and all the works that was uh, recited by other people. But my talk is mostly going to be how modern science is actually uncannily similar to its uh, basic thoughts as has been the, the age of wisdom of India Vedas, Upanishads that has been, as I said, most eloquently exposed or uh, presented by Tagore and uh, we live in the society today which is technical which not only has given us abundance that our forefathers could only dream of, but also it has created a global civilization where we really are part of one community, becoming at least part of one community. Fair to say that uh, we're living through a time where the world is fractious, sometimes confrontational, and fortunately, we humans have no natural enemy except ourselves. Only person who can wipe us out is ourselves, and we have ten times more stockpile of nuclear weapons than, to, than necessary to destroy the world just once. So how do we survive in that? If we understand the basic philosophy 
that India has been uh, uh, exposing over the years and as I said very eloquently uh, presented by Tagore through all of his all the media that uh, that you can think of uh, we need to uh, really not only really understand it we had to uh, it is necessary for our survival uh, the, you know the dinosaurs were not particularly known to be intelligent yet they survived for 200 million years on the a meteorite uh, hitting the earth destroyed them and uh, fortunately for us as I said we are the only our natural enemy we have no other natural enemy we are the only one who can destroy us uh, sure the uh, same thing can happen again with the as, as it uh, happened to wipe out the dinosaurs but uh, fortunately technology has advanced to the point where we're keeping very close track of the meteorites that could destroy us and we have the means to divert them to save the world so there is no reason why human being could not sing their swan song at least a billion years from now billion years from now when earth as it uh, utilizes as sun utilizes its fuel uh, and uh, the uh, earth temperature starts to uh, uh, change that uh, water might evaporate and but again we have the technology to solve that also we can uh, uh, I will not go into that but uh, uh, the scientists believe me that that that's, that's technology is possible so uh, I think that uh, we can fairly say that human being there's no reason why human being cannot be alive for at least a billion years till or or much longer up to five billion years say uh, when we would be singing our swan songs um, and in fact now in, to, uh, in 21st century science is uh, progressing at such a fast clip almost exponentially. I really wish that I was a fly in the wall even a thousand years from now to see how human beings are living, how, how, what new progress has actually been achieved. But uh, nevertheless what has been achieved only in merely 400 years of modern science is immensely uh, uh, immensely impressive and uh, I like to give you a little uh, hint of that. Uh, it's very hard to uh, explain all of that that has happened in the whole 20th century in uh, one hour talk. But uh, I've written a book which has come out of the second edition, uh, Code New God, where I have presented how uh, the basic thoughts of uh, oneness from which everything is. Uh, comes from that has been at the center of all spiritual traditions as well as the, our Vedic uh, uh, and Open uh, uh, has been talk, talking about. Uh, and now, as I mentioned, it's really truly anchored in science. So, uh, if those of you who are interested, you can have a copy of the yeah, second edition of the book that just came out. I'm not uh, really trying to sell my book to you, but uh, uh, I, I think that if you are truly interested, it would be worthwhile looking at it. Uh, so, uh, I, in, in order to start, i sort of give you a little background. We humans, have been around here or hominid species, the Homo habilis, actually lived for about two and a half million years ago, and the modern humans started to evolve about 100,000 years or so ago. But uh, 
at the very beginning we're all nomadic uh, uh, hunter gatherer uh, uh, tribes that uh, roamed the world. Eventually settling down in the Bhattal uh, river valleys of the earth in temperate zones like Nile Valley in Egypt, the Tigris Euphrates valleys uh, in uh, uh, Babylonia, of which became the Mesopotamian Empire, and the Indus Valley, where we belong, and the Euro River Valleys in China, and so forth. After they invented agriculture, so domesticated animal, and uh, farming, eventually society uh, grew from that into uh, modern day society. But about 5,000 years ago, so society was advanced enough to start thinking about some of the questions that still haunt us, sort of, uh, not haunts us, but uh, actually still we're seek seeking answers to. And like questions like, why are we here? Who or what or something? brought us here. What is the purpose? Is there any purpose? And what might be the future? Of course, we do not have answers to all of the questions, but at least we have some answers, good answers to some of the questions, and we're still looking. Uh, and I'd like to present to you what we know so far, and what has been gleaned through contemplations and uh, uh, meditations throughout the ages being about 5,000 years ago when we started in Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, in, in this valley, in the river valleys and so forth. But one thing we know well, that uh, all of those civilizations have uh, come and gone in Egypt as for 3,000 years, they really had a continuing dynasty and then wiped out with the uh, impatience uh, coming from the uh, first Greece and the Roman so, uh, uh, Muslim Empire and so forth. And uh, China developed uh, the, their own philosophy eventually. They were attracted to Buddhism and uh, now that is, has even changed. They have become, uh, you know, uh, socialist, and uh, they are repudiating all of their ancestral uh, ancestral thoughts. But India is the only country that we can think of that had a continuous strain of uh, thoughts and civilization for five thousand years. Uh, I, I do not know of any other country that has really had the uh, uh, fortunate uh, uh, circumstance that India had. Sure, this, during that time, thoughts have changed and evolved, but finally, during the Vedic time the, uh, and the Vedanta time, the Upanishads, thoughts matured and then it came to the conclusion that uh, behind all of this creation, there is one entity that they call Brahma. Uh, everything else is manifestation of Brahma. In Sanskrit, there is one word. Uh, those of you who are not familiar, uh, just I guess you have to take my word for it. Sarbon Khalidon Brahma means. Brahma, the one source, exists always intertwined with everything else that exists in this universe, including us. It's also said, Om Brahmasmi, I am Brahma. Essentially, since we are different, we are different parts of Brahma. Tatvamosi, so are you. So you and I and everything else that exists in this universe are 
essentially different manifestations of one entity that we call Brahma. And uh, everything changes because manifestation of Brahma is of course the, what the universe is all about. Manifestation by, na by its nature has to change. So apart from Brahma, change is the only permanent thing essentially in terms of manifestation. But while everything is changing, Brahma, the, uh, uh, that is at the uh, core of everything, the one source, is unchanged. Has not changed since almost the beginning of time. And these were the uh, thoughts that has guided the uh, uh, people who had the privilege of living in the continent, of the subcontinent, of, uh, so to speak, that we uh, call India. But uh, it has gone through many explanations because when it started there is no writing. Basically it was handed down from uh, wise men to wise men through uh, Shruti, uh, through uh, RBH. Eventually got into writing of course. Um, but the essence of it has been explained and, ex uh, and explicated by many talented people in the olden time. In the recent time, uh, the one person that really has understood it very deeply and through, again, merely contemplation and meditation and thinking, came to the realization that oneness was Tagore himself. He has been able to explain it in all the way of our expression, uh, essays, uh, dramas, music, <coughs> poems, and uh, you can whatever you can think of. He has really explained them through so that how the oneness of Brahma exists, always being intertwined with you, me, and everything else that exists. And in the sense, we are really all connected. How would we not be? But these are all contemplation and that came from purely mental uh, th thoughts. But today we live in a scientific society and we have a natural belief in the way of methods of science. So when science actually backs it up on its anchors, the thoughts, then we really accept them to be true. And fortunately, when I was studying science and uh, one of the, I was, I was privileged to have my graduate studies with the eminent scientist S. N. Bose, whose name is famous for boson particles and the Bose Einstein statistics. Uh, he was, of course, a theoretician and uh, uh, personal mentor and uh, ex uh, sort of uh, uh, got my knack for science or uh, devotion or almost now it's a uh, sort of a, uh, a deep absorption into science <laughs> so through his uh, 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 leadership, through his uh, mentorship. And uh, so, as you have seen from the little video that I was born in a very, very primitive, uh, poor uh, society, where life was nothing more than what it was about almost three, four thousand years ago, nothing much had changed. The order of the day was superstition, blind faith, 
fear, not to speak of hunger and poverty. So, as a child, that's how I developed. But today, I have my mindset geared to 21st century, as all of you in this room are. What made me transform from that is really my understanding of science and understanding our place in this universe and how what question, what answers we have to these perennial questions that I posed to you at the beginning. So um, most of my talk would be trying to get you to in tune with that uh, thinking. Although for people who are not really uh, going through science, it's a little bit hard for them because uh, the, uh, it, it really requires a paradigm shift in our thinking. Because our da daily uh, world is something that we, we of course, uh, we, we live in and we, uh, we uh, are uh, uh, geared and we are born, we are raised to live through, through it. That's why it becomes a little difficult to perceive the reality, our, our sense perception that allows us to survive only is so limited compared to the past subject and the area that science actually uh, 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 engaged in is really mind boggling For example, in this room, it's full of air. We're breathing it. Without that, we cannot survive. Yet, you cannot uh, see them. You cannot touch. You, you can feel them when they wave back in the trees. There's also gravity, for example, which is pitting you down on your seat. You don't feel that. You don't, uh, only when you try to stand up, that you, you, you happen to feel it. But so is just to give you two examples. There is so much that we deal in science that is beyond our usual perception. That uh, it, at the at the first thought, it becomes very hard to really get get it used to the uh, uh, intricacies and the belief that. Uh, but us scientists who are trained in that, we find it so fascinating that. Uh, it's almost, uh, you know, all absorbing. And uh, I uh, have realized mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the basic science all come from theoretical physics. Intuition, human intuition is something that is really paramount of importance in developing our understanding of nature understanding of who we are and uh, but of course intuition can be right it could be wrong but the gold standard of which intuition is correct is given by experimental science but nevertheless it does start with theoretical physics and uh, as professor Dirac one of the exponent of quantum physics said that everything chemistry biology and everything else can we explain in terms of the physics? It happens to be really true. And uh, so this is why I spent, I'm not a tech billionaire, but I, I uh, uh, came to UCLA with uh, $3 in my pocket. And I never thought I would even survive. But uh, this is a great country for, uh, for people who live here people who has come uh, to live here they probably on the, uh, in spite of all its troubles and travesties so the best countries in the world and uh, I think all of us here appreciate that very much in, in spite of all the problems that we sometimes experience but uh, uh, 
So when I came to academia, obviously I said I wanted to pursue science. But I realized that staying in academia did not get rid of my poverty. So I started working for companies like Xerox and Northrop Corporation, Northrop Grumman, which is the third largest defense contractor. Um, and invented the laser, laser for the LASIK, which is uh, called Eximer laser, a type of laser that we have developed with our co-workers. And the uh, specialty of this laser is that it cuts cold. Instead of burning, as most lasers do, it cuts cold. That's why it is ideally suited for ophthalmology, uh, with the laser correction of the eyesight. You, you saw in the video at one time I used to use uh, my glasses, but you can see I got rid of it. Uh, and, uh, uh, it really has uh, done wonders for many people, especially pilots, uh, sportsmen, the, uh, the beauty queens, and so forth. Uh, that's why it's so glamorous. But uh, truth be told, that uh, the laser business is only about 40 million years uh, worldwide per year, uh, while it's also used for what you call photolithography, uh, printing the chips into the for the computer, the cell phone that we use. That's in uh, uh, the interview circuits are being printed by having. Uh, using the Eximer laser. Um, so having done that, I received some stock options from the companies <coughs> and invested them wisely in California real estate, which got rid of my poverty and uh, I became quote unquote independent wealthy. So uh, as, as long as I was able to do whatever my sweet little heart desires. I thought, boy, I, I'm really free now. I can do whatever I want. And I did. I gave James Bond a run for his money for about five years. But I, having spent some time with uh, Gandhi, I realized that I have everything to be happy for. So why am I not uh, feeling like as if there's a hole in my, my uh, uh, heart? Then I realized Gandhi's pronouncement that happiness is an inside job. It doesn't come from outside. You, can, you probably know a whole bunch of very wealthy people, how it is, for example, was extremely unhappy in their life. They were getting from the house. So, so I started to realize, was Gandhi really right? Was the Hindu philosophy? By the time I kind of put it in my background, in my mind, are they really true? Because I became a skeptical scientist. I, I like to make a difference between science and between religion and spirituality. Religion has more to do with uh, nowadays, at least, with power and money, uh, because. In religion, the basic part is that thou shalt not question. You have to accept whatever is uh, told. In science, just the opposite. Don't take anybody's word for it. You shall question. And so, when I talk about spirituality, spirituality is religion without the excess baggage of uh, not having the ability to ask questions. And there, the, uh, the, that's the true spirituality that uh, I was looking for through science. And, uh, you know, when I was doing the laser work, it was, uh, or for that matter, any, any uh, cutting edge field that's fast moving, you hardly have any time to think of anything else because we're always worried about being scooped about what you're doing. So you have to run like crazy to stay crazy to stay where you are. And so I did not really have the opportunity to go through all the 
develop that is happening, scientific develop that has happened in 20th century. And after I had the uh, freedom to do what I wanted to do, I delved into it. And uh, it took me some time, about 10 years of studies. And lo and behold, I was really blown away when I realized that the uh, Uh, oneness of all religious, all spiritual tradition that has been propounded throughout the world at various times through uh, uh, various uh, countries at various different times, they really uh, can be anchored in science. And it is not complete yet. But at least that everything physical in this world, in this universe, are coming from one source. The unification of forces and fields that Einstein, the first one to uh, envision and brought into scientific uh, uh, domain, is really uh, amazingly uh, verifiable provable and one can really see that it actually mirrors uncannily what the Vedic Rishis and other spiritual uh, leaders throughout the world, throughout the universe, at different times as, it, as proposed. And that's why I wrote that book to uh, uh, put my thoughts into it and fortunately it is has been pretty well received and uh, uh, just to give you a little gist of it is that uh, the, what made possible uh, for our realization is a marriage between quantum physics and Einstein's relativity. Both of them actually were his brainchild. Uh, unfortunately, Einstein, even though he started quantum physics, he, towards the end of his life, for the last 30 years, he basically abandoned it. In fact, although scientists say that uh, in some sense uh, Einstein is the father of quantum physics, even though the word quantum, the, the chunk of energy that was first coined by Max Planck, but he did not believe in it. Einstein, about five years later, actually said, it is real, it's not just a mathematical fancy. And nobody else believed in him. In fact, even Max Planck didn't believe in it. In fact, uh, 10 years after Max Planck proposed it, he was introducing Einstein to the Prussian Academy of Sciences to be a member. And uh, there was also Professor Nernst and other scientists. And Frank himself, it was amusing to hear him say that Einstein is a very good scientist, but at times he makes some mistakes, like his thought of uh, quantum in the air. And uh, so that was spoken by the man who coined the word quantum, Max Planck. And so he was the sole support of the idea of quantum and which is exhibited in the wave particle duality of matter uh, for about two decades uh, nobody else supported him He's, he really stuck to this that's why he's by many is considered the uh, father of quantum physics but also these days he's called that did with that because after giving birth to his idea, having the child, he left the field uh, because uh, it's fair to say that uh, that, that uh, Einstein believed that the quantum physics eventually would be explained in terms of the daily classical reality that we observe and we live in. But uh, 
what we have understood now, which he Einstein really missed, is the only thing that I think he missed, is that uh, quantum world really is different. It's full of uh, liveliness. And somehow the transitions that in, uh, underpinning reality transitions into a daily classical reality. This is the part where uh, Einstein was very dissatisfied and uh, as a result, he, for the last 30 years of his life, he pursued the unification without the quantum physics. And obviously that is not possible, that's why he failed. But uh, my professor Walsh also followed him and fell in the same trap, uh, avoiding quantum physics, bringing it into the unification. But now, in fact, the first person who showed uh, the uh, union of quantum physics uh, and uh, the classical physics is uh, but over 90 years old, lives not too far from here, about 200 miles in Austin, University of Texas, uh, Stephen Weinberg. He got the Nobel Prize uh, for the first demonstration of how uh, two different forces, what we call weak force, uh, that, are, that is so short that you can't even get out of the nucleus. Like the uh, nucleus is already 10 to the minus 8 centimeters, and this uh, short force cannot have any interaction beyond 10 to the minus 13 centimeter, while electromagnetic force can go from one end of the universe to the other. And when those two diverse forces show unification, and that was Weinberg was the pioneer on that, uh, that really broke the barriers in physicists' mind that indeed it is possible that everything that we see was so diverse, yet they really actually come from one single source. Well, we haven't quite completely done the work yet. Uh, in fact, the Institute of Theoretical Physics that you saw, that I have studied at UCLA, our main goal is to show that, uh, to, to, uh, in, uh, to show the unification. One particular example is the uh, gravity. Gravity is the force that is still not combined. Rest of the three forces, more or less everybody believes that it's been combined. And, uh, and nobody really that I know of is belief that it not be. Uh, and it's just a matter of time. Look how long it took to really find Higgs boson. 40 years ago it was uh, uh, proposed. Gravity waves. I stand proposed that in way back in 19, uh, uh, and, uh, 19 or something like that to, uh, to see the actual demonstration of the gravity the waves. Just uh, recently, in fact, uh, the Nobel Prize was given the last year and uh, we were fortunate to have the lecture by the uh, one of the recipients, Skip Thorne, at the Institute. And, uh, so, Sometimes things take time. In fact, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, who passed away recently, uh, in his book, A Brief History of Time, which has sold about 10 million uh, copies throughout the world, he predicted in 1980 that probably in our lifetime we'll see all the forces unified, all, everything unified. Well, yeah. it hasn't done yet, but nobody really disbelieves, nobody really disagrees that it will be. And so it's a matter of time. And, and I'm really, yeah, so wait, waiting breathlessly to see uh, progress towards that. And we are beginning with progress at the university, as well as quite a few other places in the universe. There is a, actually, already a mathematically consistent uh, unified theory, which is goes by the name of string theory. But unfortunately, it doesn't yet 
describe an experiment that can be verified in the laboratory. And uh, so we don't accept, as I said, intuition is the mother's milk, so to speak, but yet intuition not verified by experiment is not, it is still philosophy, it's not science. And uh, so that's why string theory, even though it has been really, uh, developed with a as I said, mathematically consistent, that is the criterion of acceptance of a theory, uh, but it is not really uh, yet has predicted any uh, detectable results that we can verify with our present experiments. Uh, so we are looking for indirect evidence, uh, like proton decay experiments that is going on, and of course, the uh, quantum gravity uh, research that is going on in UCLA which is a uh, straightforward extension of the what we call the quantum field theory of the standard model. Uh, that has unified the three other forces. Uh, so uh, we're proceeding from various uh, fields, but then that's the way we believe that uh, sooner or later, all of this, uh, we will find the, uh, that everything that exists really uh, all coming from one source. Right now we know that uh, for every particle there is the underlying quantum field. For electron for example, there is the underlying electron field. Uh, photon has underlying electromagnetic field. And uh, so everything that exists has a quantum field. Some of them has been united. Some of them are still not, but I think we are well on our way towards proving that everything is coming from one single source. So at least the, uh, uh, everything physical that exists. Now that brings us to the point for what consciousness? Uh, well, one other aspect of Brahma is that uh, Brahma is not only one, but is also consciousness. Now consciousness is to be really the physicist's closet, so to speak, which is not a polite conversation, a topic of polite conversation uh, up until 1960s actually. In fact, they say that the hippies actually have saved consciousness. But uh, actually, Sir Roger Penrose, who is one of the uh, most famous living physicists, uh, like uh, uh, <clears throat> Stephen Weinberg uh, wrote two seminal books, Emperor's New Mind, Shadows of Mind, where he gave modern uh, uh, theoretical explanation how consciousness could arise. It is an ongoing subject, there's a lot has been done in terms of those of the physicians, right? You know, that, uh, how our brain works, how uh, consciousness can change the brain. Brain, is, brain has plasticity, brain, uh, in a neuroplasticity, brain can change itself. And, uh, uh, this is what, you know, uh, goes back to the old ideas of uh, the meditation to cure yourself, and, uh, uh, which is becoming more or less uh, uh, well established in scientific tradition. Uh, I saw Dalai Lama's in here. Uh, he provided some of the uh, monks who study uh, or meditate all day long, and uh, uh, he provided some of them to Richard Davidson at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. And he did a really thorough study about uh, how our mind and brain can heal itself. How different parts uh, really lights up under the uh, in, uh, uh, proper instrument NMR, Nicholas to show <coughs> that uh, the feeling that you have from meditation actually has a physical manifestation that you can measure through experiments, 
and uh, I think there will be more studies in UCLA actually as a uh, center, a normal kind of center for long name, psychoneuroimmunology, which basically means how the mind can heal. In fact, at one time I uh, started a worldwide competition about how the best work done in the world to prove the effect of mind in healing. <coughs> Richard Davison was one of the recipients and several others, but we ran out of people. The members were one of them. We ran out of people who were doing, doing their work. And uh, so right now, we're uh, <coughs> waiting for some other people, some, some other good work to be done. Uh, and I, I'm a true believer of that, and I have expressed that in my book also. And I not only have the, uh, I would say, uh, a deep understanding of uh, quantum physics, which I'm still very engrossed in research, and, and uh, <clears throat> hopefully uh, that be my, uh, my ultimate legacy <laughs> uh, that uh, something that I understand was not able to explain it because he just didn't look into it. Not that I'm smarter than Einstein, but at least uh, uh, we have the tools today that was not available in his time uh, to uh, <coughs> look into what the quantum world is like. I'd like to end this my talk, uh, taking a little bit of time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, <coughs> by showing a sort of a, without going to the math, which is very, very complicated for a full theory of standard model of particle physics, speaking now, name now, <clears throat> but what it really means that uh, the ultimate uh, reality, ultimate layer of reality that we have been able to unfold through scientific investigation is something if you're a solid, it will look, look like an ocean throughout this whole big universe, which is really unimaginable humanly to, uh, to determine how big it is. Uh, but everywhere, this, uh, these quantum fields, which are abstract, which are something that we are fortunate not to be able to perceive because its activity is extremely fast infinite dynamism because quantum fields have infinite degrees of freedom and so it's always active and with, it, with quantum activity by that I mean it has a special characteristic any particular event in that uh, infinite dynamism take it is totally spontaneous and completely unpredictable as to exactly when that particular event is taking place. And that is going throughout the whole universe. And that infinite dynamism, in my mind, is something that propels our activity. That we are really infinite dynamism of the universe, of uh, one us, of now, is manifesting through us. That's what we, we all come to live our life, then eventually. Without exception, we all grow because that makes room for evolution. That what we call better life. Uh, without life and death, we we'll all still be deemed blue green algae. And uh, but evolution declares that we live with more power, that we grow, make up. Nobody has been able to beat that system, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, that's the way it actually has to be. Was there been uh, no change? But one thing has remained exactly the same for the community <coughs> is the source, the cone of fears. That, uh, in modern terms, we call it the cone of fears, the unification of it, the, uh, the, the one source that I described, <coughs> uh, which everybody believes that will be proven sooner or later. But the, the thing to remember is that that field is not, you know, looks, everything looks very inert, 
stable. But really, truly speaking, there is no rest energy. Rest maps, yes, this bottle is rest. But every atom inside it is full of infinite dynamism. So energy is never at rest. And in fact, we can see uh, in uh, the one I on deploy came up with the idea of matter that uh, uh, matter is not just a little marble ball, is actually is, is uh, actually vibrating, the energy is vibrating. Energy is not at rest. Matter is at rest, it can be at rest, you can of course be moving. But as soon as it starts to move, even slowly, because it's vibrating so fast, you can see the special electricity effect in the form of a wave, matter wave. So that's a direct proof, and also there are other proofs like uh, Casimir effect and uh, all, all, all kinds of proofs that, that uh, I don't think uh, we like to go into, into, into here. But uh, uh, that infinite activity uh, of nature, infinite dynamics of the nature, is really something anybody who wants to prove it to themselves, it's not too difficult. I believe that uh, that's what you know. Uh, we're here for to, to, to manifest the infinite dynamism. Einstein said one thing that uh, we come here for a short time and we go, not knowing why we are here, but we manage to divine the purpose uh, for which we uh, we feel we are living. As from the scientist's viewpoint, that's what we feel that we are really manifesting the infinite dynamism that is inherent in the universe through us, through our activity, through our life, and is going to better and better to, to can you imagine it hundred years ago things were so different, we didn't understand much. But today at this Group of people uh, at different universities, like University, uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, at UCLA, Berkeley, here in Austin. A group of people understand uh, that uh, we are really uh, nothing but manifestation of that uh, ultimate reality, ultimate layer that we have been able to uncover so far. The science is never ending. It's uh, you know. Probably because it doesn't make room for gravity yet, and uh, dark matter, uh, energy, for example. But no matter what comes up later on, what we know today is not going to be overthrown. Like when Newton uh, came up with theories, it rained for 200 years, uh, and we still use it for designing a rocket ship, cars, and machineries. But when you go to higher gravity or uh, faster speed, then you have to modify with Einstein's uh, uh, theory. So whatever comes up uh, beyond what we have been able to uh, ex uh, explore so far, what we call the ultimate reality, is eventually will be uh, has to be modified by something that will. Uh, make room for some of the things that has not been unified yet. But it should not be thrown out, just like Newton's laws is never thrown out, it just be expanded. So with that confidence, I think it's fair to say that we're pretty close to supporting the ancient thoughts of the Vedic Rishis, as well as the other exponents throughout the world, that we are all connected Really, we are all connected physically to quantum fields, which pervades all space and time, just like we're like a little bubble of water, a little ripple of water, which is intimately connected to the ocean. And that is really necessary for us to get it under our belt. Every man, woman, and child really. Uh, have some way of getting under the belt because 
and they may say, we are the only one who can destroy ourselves. And uh, to avoid that and to improve our quality of life, and as I've said, not only improve our quality of life, it has changed my life in terms of my outlook. In my, we know that uh, brain's neuroplasticity changes itself, and uh, I'm not where I am today when I was a child. What has changed? This idea of uh, uh, un, uh, sort of getting under my belt, the idea of the science has come up with that has helped me, and I think uh, it will eventually help all of humanity. And may we sing our song song billions of years from now. In the meantime, it is really given us abundance, as I said, our <coughs> forefathers could only imagine. Life expect expectancy has doubled in the last hundred years, and, uh, and uh, uh, so both the uh, uh, both the eternal song of India and other places uh, now verified by science and will help us in our life, leading a good life through billions of years, I should say. Thank you for your attention and I hope that uh, uh, I have at least given you a little taste of what we scientists are going through and uh, uh, also at the same time those who are uh, actually practicing to realize this oneness through meditation has been done throughout the ages. This will be helpful for, for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.